Hello, reader. I'm Alex. I'm Kelly. And this is the The Lit Joy Podcast. Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by our King of Scars annotated edition with Lee Bardugo. So we have done the Six of Crows duology. We did the Shadow and Bone trilogy. And now we're finally on to King of Scars. This is a duology. It features Nikolai Mm -hmm. from, okay. And uh, I'm like trying to remember. It's been, I read him immediately when they came out. I would say book one in this duology is my, One of my absolute favorite Lee Bardugo books, um, and I really loved it. It is in the similar vein in artwork and customizations to the other two box sets. So it will have um, the first book will be annotated. There's a new cover design, which coordinates and matches the other two box sets, but will very much be in the vein of Nikolai's story. There's also a digital signature in both books, tip and art pages throughout, and paper art, and a custom slipcase, which has really cool, like, interactive elements on it because we can't not. And um, there are page edges that are custom as well. And if you've seen what Rosie's done with the first two box sets, you will absolutely love the third. And it's, of course, printed on acid-free paper. So it is, like, you know, art quality preserves the artwork. This is available to Lunicorns on the 24th. So if you don't know what our Lunacorn membership is, it is a private membership group for folks who are huge fans of reading Lit Joy Special Editions, and they get early access to things. And that's happening April 24th. April 25th is public access. So if you want to find this or get on a notify me list or go shopping right now, Go to litjoycrate.com slash Grisha. That's G-R-I-S-H-A. And if you've read Lee, you know what Grisha are. So today we are on part four of the series that no one asked for, (laughs) Books to Movies. You're welcome. (laughs) It's our podcast. Uh, We just can't stop talking about them. They're so much fun. It's true. And apparently something we have a lot of opinions about. We do. Opinions that are ours alone and uh, you can share them or you can disagree with them <laughs> and write us a strongly worded email yeah we'll review it yeah maybe we'll, we're... we'll take it into consideration <laughs> oh, it, we're like a little unhinged i know but it is really fun because i feel like it's kind of inconsequential like i'm still gonna go to all the movies yeah, i'm yeah. still gonna give them my money oh yeah just so that i can judge it and even though like i didn't make the movie i'm like i've got feelings <laughs> <laughs> well that's what so much All right. So we talked through, I don't know, it was like five to seven movies last time. Yeah. It was a blur. Um, I know we ended on Wonder. We did. And I love that one. And so let's move into something. We're going to talk about another classic because they can't stop making those. It's true. I think it's because it's public domain. So they don't have to pay royalties. (laughs) They're like, we can rework that. Yeah. It's true. So uh, let's talk about Little Women. Yes. This is such a sweet book, such a beautiful movie. There's been several adaptions. Let's talk through this one because uh, in our last episode, we talked through a lot of the classics, how many times they've been adapted in different yes. ways. So Little Women is is similar and that it's had a lot of ad- uh, adaptions done. This book was written by Louisa May Alcott, um, and I believe she is an American author. The books were originally published in 1868 through 1869, and it's kind of loosely based on Louise's life. So with the four sisters, kind of it's it's considered semi-autobiographical. One thing that's really interesting about Little Women is that it was an immediate success, like an immediate commercial success, which wow. just isn't the case for so many authors. Yeah. Back then, too, especially, especially. as a woman, you know, so many of them had to have pen names to sound more masculine, right? Yes. Um, and I actually didn't know that until you just told me. And I'm wondering how that has happened, that it was slightly auto- autobiographical. Yeah. It's so he said that I'm all good to know. That makes sense. Well, I think that like every author has parts of themselves in a story. Oh, yeah. For sure. And especially, you know, women in this Regency area or Regency era. I think that like a lot of Jane Austen novels or the Bronte sisters, they're probably putting infusing their stories with some autobiographical moments, Mm -hmm. right? Like Jane Austen lived in Bath, so she can inform what life was like in Bath Mm -hmm. at that time because she's writing contemporary. Because really a lot of these classics by these female authors that we've been talking about are 
contemporary fiction. Mm. So they have a lot of those things in them about their life. Um, But to us, it just feels different because it feels like such a looking back experience. Mm. Um, I want to talk about and have a a lively debate. (laughs) I want to talk about the 1994 film versus the 2019 film. Oh, yes. Because I feel like both of these are, uh, I feel like we were of the perfect age and generation to resonate so strongly with both of them. I thought you were going to say judge, and I'm all... Oh, judge is another... <laughs> it's a spicy take on it. Okay, I grew up watching the 1994 Winona Ryder, mm. Winona Ryder, uh, Little Women, just... At, it was a staple of my childhood. I watched it probably hundreds of times growing up. Really? So did you watch it a lot growing up or no? No, but that's probably because I didn't have any sisters growing up. Okay. I didn't relate to it as well. I remember everyone yes. related to it but me because I was like, I have one brother yeah, and it's just me and him and I always wanted a sister. And so there was part of me that I think struggled to connect because I knew I was so envious of all these sisters and their interactions and their connection, the relationship that they have. I wanted that so bad. And so like as I've grown more, you know, in my reading preferences and I've gone back and reread Little Women, I definitely resonate more with it now than yes. I did then. Yes. Um, but I'm like, I'm very curious to know which one did you prefer, the 94 or the 2019? Okay. So I loved the 2019 and yeah. thought it was really well made. I loved the casting. Um, but I don't know. I just, the 1994 one will forever hold my heart. Oh, that's right. I had Kirsten Dunstan. Yeah. So she was Amy. She was, you know, very young in it. It also had Christian Bale. Claire Dane. Yes. It was such a great cast. And also, oh, um, Susan. Uh, Susan Sarandon, which I love. Yeah. It was such, I mean, and the casting was great on the 2019 one. Mm. But I was just, I felt like the age of the girls held up more mm. in the 94 film. Um, it seemed like the them transitioning from girls into women felt more natural, whereas it felt like a, in the 2019 one, they all felt like they kind of stayed the same age throughout uh, the whole. It, it's hard to take that leap from like a 14 year old to a 24 year old woman mm-hmm. it, with the same actress. And so that that's a challenging thing. Time passing in yeah. this in this novel makes it tricky to age your actors. Does that make sense? Kind of reminds me of the, you know, the epilogue scene in Harry Potter. Oh my gosh, it was so bad. 20 years older or something. It was so bad. And all all they did was give him a pop belly on poor Ron. I know, they just (laughs) gave Ron a little bit of... And then they made him all frumpy looking. (laughs) Yeah. So I just remember that, well, that's a tricky one to do, so. It is tricky. I feel like with CGI though, they could have done something. Yeah, and that's why I think they continually remake these movies, right? They're like, it, right. it could be better now. For sure. Little Women's a little different because it's it's all about the relationships and yes. their interactions. And I feel like both movies did that well. Like yes. the connections, the relationships, all those interactions were so well done. All of the chemistry is great. I don't really have anything negative, I don't think, to say because I'm yeah. not as well versed in that first one. But it is, I just, I think the first one that you grow up with, it's so hard to move past it. It is. Because it's just like burrowed in there as part of your nostalgia. Yeah. Like I remember watching the 94 film. It was like Christmas. We lived in, it was before we moved to Washington. So I still lived in Utah in like first or second grade. And um, it was, I probably was actually just in first grade from this memory, kindergarten or first grade. And I remember that um, me and my mom stayed up late and watched it. And then instead of making cinnamon toast in the toaster, we wanted to feel like we were little women like baking. Aww. And so we took bread and butter and cinnamon and put it in the oven and did <laughs> cinnamon toast that way. And, and I was like, can I be Joe? And my mom's like, yeah, I'll be ma-. like we were pretending to be different sisters. And so I have like a core memory around that film. I also just think that Winona Ryder is such a good Joe. Mm. Um, yeah, like just have like ingrained memories with that movie yeah also though it's it's interesting um christian bale and timothy chalamet are interesting Mm -hmm. uh, teddies um and like they just brought something totally Totally different different. like timothy i felt like it was difficult to see him age into being more of an adult 
Whereas Christian seems so grown up yeah, right yeah. away. And that was an interesting kind of relationship with them. Mm-hmm. Both are so good at it. Like you said, totally in different ways. Mm-hmm. But you're right. I remember seeing Timothy and being like, I don't know. Like he made so much sense in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And the aging up part is where I was like, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I don't know if you could handle Florence Pugh. Yeah. Like, she's such a force. Yes. And yes, so, that's kind of the vibe. I'm like, what is it that wasn't quite settling them all? Something, they weren't matched equally in the older years. But I think that's the energy I was trying to describe. I mean, she can really command a screen. Mm. Also, though, her and Oppenheimer, Ooh. she was so good. Did you see that one? I did. Yeah. Yeah. She was fantastic. Yeah. Like just, well, that movie was incredible. I so. know. It really sad movie. <laughs> it was like very intense. But also I just felt like she is, in my mind, such a huge presence on screen. Mm-hmm. It, it takes like quite a bit mm-hmm. of like commanding energy, I think, to yeah. be on screen with her. So I don't know. I've got a crush on Florence Pugh, apparently. I was like, oh my gosh. Oh my, and I just want to be friends with Timothy. So For like, sure. I'm like, oh, he was so good in Wonka too. Yeah. That was really darling. We're just bouncing all over. It's okay. Yeah, it's great because Wonka, my kids loved that movie. Oh, we should just throw that on the list. Jeez. Um, yeah. I'm like, and we're just going to do it. Pivot. Pivot. Wonka. <laughs> that was, I mean, clearly it was a deviation in the, in, in yes. the adaption. It's like an adaption where it's almost, it's a prequel. It, yeah, it was the backstory. It was to, Wonka's backstory. Yeah, which doesn't exist, but I love that they did it because it, it's like a new spin and a breath, breathe new life into that story in such a beautiful way. Because yeah. I was really nervous. Every adaption is usually very different. Like when Tim Burton yeah. got it, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, Tim Burton always is like, this is kind of dark. Let's make it very dark. It made sense to me, though, why Tim Burton is interested in Roald Dahl's work. For sure. All of Roald Dahl's stuff is a little macabre or just a little bit um, twisty. twisty, a little bit like eyebrow raise, but all mm-hmm. right, you know, because. I grew up on that, and it's yeah. very interesting as a child to read about something that just feels completely, like, out of this world. The thing that's always interesting about a Roald Dahl book is the themes of death are always explored, um, but never in really objective ways. So it's not like you're experiencing the death of a character as death. It's just like, and then the child disappears. And we just have to assume death or life. Uh, or, um, for example, in like The Witches, one of the characters is turned into like a mouse forever. And yeah. you're kind of like, oh, and then the book ends. Or um, James and, Di- and the Giant Peach, there is the death of parents right there. It's just, he has that similar theme of kind of like, macabre and dark and evil things can happen and they don't always have an explanation i've read almost all of his books yeah me too and um, his autobiographies are some of my favorites because you once you read uh so it's boy and going solo or his two autobiographies um you can absolutely see all the tie-ins to the books he's written almost all of them i'm like Fantastic Mr. Fox and like ECO Trout would be like, okay, I don't know about <laughs> what that, but, those are. A, <laughs> he dev, he but diverged like, into something. Matilda, there. you know, things like yes. there's just so many things where I'm like, oh, and even Willy Wonka, like all of those have little pieces from his real life. Yes, like the abusive parents or poverty. Keep going. And just like running to the candy shop and having your penny to buy your penny candy, you know, and just how that like spurred this whole thought process about wanting to create this book about Willy Wonka um, or having very strict uh, principal and teachers and growing up and that kind of created the Trunchbull and Matilda. And it's just really fun to see when you read the autobiography. He has an, he had an incredible life. Like it is fascinating to read. He was a uh, pilot in World War II. Yes. And when his, his plane crashed and I think he was, oh, I'm trying to remember, for, I think it was in Africa somewhere. Like he was like hanging out with tigers and lions and he had a really bad um, injury though. And mm-hmm. so he couldn't continue on and being in the Navy or the, uh, sorry, excuse me, the Air Force. But uh, yeah, his works are so interesting because you can bring them to life in so many different ways. As you mentioned, his themes vary. And mm-hmm. so with like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the original um, with... Um, Oh, uh, Um, Gene Wilder? Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. That one was very true to the book in a lot of ways. But it's interesting because his character, uh, Wonka, um, I feel like that was the best representation from the book. But even then, it was still a little bit more stern sometimes. Yes. But um, 
like <laughs> my favorite line is good day, sir. Yes. I said good day. Yeah. Just that little oomph at the end because he has these childlike qualities as an adult. And it's yes. like this little tantrum. Um, and then like Tim Burton got it and he's like really gonna make this weird. Yeah. And um he leaned into that and did that interpretation. And so then Wonka, I was like, which way are we gonna go here? Um and I loved it because it really just amplified the whimsy of the books, which For is sure. I think what I'm most drawn to. Yeah, there was um such an innocence to Wonka in this, uh, to the character of Wonka yeah. in this new take. And I think that it was the Wonka movie we needed. Mm-hmm. Um, because what's interesting from the books is I find often, it, this kind of happened with Dumbledore and um, and I'm reading Lord of the Rings, so Gandalf as well, mm-hmm. where they're quite a bit more of a whimsical character in the books. And then when we bring them to the big screen, they seem much more serious yeah. on screen. The actors, I think, it's difficult to do whimsy and to still resonate sometimes yeah. on screen um, because sometimes you just seem too immature or too aloof or... Yeah, it's it, almost like childlike. Yeah, and it kind of pulls the viewer out of the film. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I understand the kind of challenge there. And if you go really hard yeah. in that serious mode, it feels that the stakes are higher and so people are more invested too. Yeah. But you miss out on some of that whimsy or that humor that you get in books. Like in yeah. Outlander as well, Claire is much yeah. more funny and spunky in the books, mm-hmm. but she's so serious in the series, um, the TV series. Yeah. And so one thing I did love is it felt more like that childlike innocence that Wonka is in the book. Yeah. Um, He's just so naive, right, in the right. books. And- he just, I feel like he just really believes that, like, the best outcome will happen. Yeah. I, that's why I love that moment at the very end of Wonka, okay, where he he's like he logically knew and kind of mentioned that he knows his mom's not coming back. Yeah. Know? And um that even at the very end after he did the thing, you know, if you haven't seen it, and he created the store and he still kind of expected her to be there. And he yeah. was sad when she wasn't. That's like that childlike, you know, expression that I was talking about that's absolutely threaded through all of his books that I think, you know, that's what children connect to and what adults connect to is yeah. that feeling of being like, "Oh yeah, that like just pureness there. And then, yeah. I mean, he had his moment at the end where he kind of got to feel, see the spirit of his mother, which was so sweet. Yeah. I might have teared up. I did too. I did too. But I think part of it is, um, I think as adults, when you talk about doing work or therapy or working through trauma or whatever it is, really what you're doing is you're just going back to the person you were as an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 15-year-old or however old you were when that thing happened. And you're just giving that you the thing you needed that you didn't get. Yep. Um, and that's how you heal is you show up for that you and you go back to that moment. And I think that you see that in so many of these authors' works and especially in Roald Dahl's is he grew up in a really traumatic time historically yep. in a time where you know, you could get away with a lot in the way you treated children. Mm-hmm. And so these each of these books feels kind of like a like a going back and giving that child the wonder that they needed at that moment or the experience they needed or the safety, yeah. the found family, like James and the Giant Peach, whatever it is yeah. that they needed. So he's a he's a um an interesting character as a person. Rodal mm-hmm. is a controversial character, like, yeah. and um, and I get that. I don't think that there is an excuse to be made, but I do think his works are very fascinating to mm-hmm. read as an adult and then to witness kind of these remakes of it. Yeah. Well, we enjoyed Wonka. Yeah, I don't think I have anything negative to say about that one. I even I think that they worked really well with bringing in the Oompa Loompas because I know uh, you know like now versus when that was first published. It's just there's. Like you need sensitivity to be more there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just like so delighted with how. Oh my gosh! <laughs> with Hugh Grant, Hugh and Grant yeah. was so good. So I can't he's stop. Off. I'm sorry. He's <laughs> off. sorry. Once you start dancing, you can't, can't stop. stop. 
It was so funny. It was amazing. And I had, I remember we came out of, I, we came out of that film and I think we were talking in like a meeting at work and one of the employees was like, I don't know, I just thought like I didn't like the Oompa Loompa part. I thought it was super dumb. And I was just like, I'll have to keep all my feelings to myself on this <laughs> because you are wrong. <laughs> It was a delight. And it, it, you have to have the like homage. The humor and the like. Yeah, yeah. Because you're like, okay, explain to me why he has a bunch of little people yeah. working for him. And they're like, okay, we've got this backstory too. And everything he wrote was just so outlandishly over the top in certain ways. Yes. So it's like green hair, orange skin, you know, from this like island that doesn't exist, but it does. And um, I just like that there's no boundaries in yeah. some ways. You know, Think outside the box. Be creative. You know, that's, I think, why I was so drawn in as a kid in a lot yeah. of ways. But um, the side note, like, nobody's read one of my favorite books by him, which is called Danny, the Champion of the World. Has it? Have you read that oh, one? No. Yeah. It's, okay. it's a lot more um, almost like contemporary of his. Okay. Um, and then there's other ones I've never read as, like, adult books. And I don't know if I want to. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. want it's it to tricky. ruin anything for He's me. He's kind of like Neil Gaiman. Um, like, Neil Gaiman, I feel like yeah. some of his books, I'm all... Oh, that got so dark. Mm. Like, I always am kind of like toe align with some of his stuff because it always does have those macabre themes similar. Yeah. Um, I would say to Roald Dahl's kind of like there's the macabre themes in there throughout. Mm. Um, and there's certainly real human strife and struggle. But some of his books lean more whimsy and some I'm like, well, that was pretty dark shit. Yeah. Like, I cannot get yeah. through Sandman. Um, the, uh, oh, the show? Uh, the show on Netflix. Oh, yeah. It's a graphic novel. So I'm yes. sure I could read the graphic novels, like prepare myself. But there are certain episodes in there that are so dark. Yeah, I agree. That I'm just like, the first, the one before wasn't as dark and the one after. But I'm like, I don't, I don't feel safe. And so I'm like. It's, I think I warned you about that episode because yes. I was like. I no, I, I warned you because I saw it first, I thought. I remember watching it and uh, I had to put it on mute. That I one episode. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, regardless, we were both were like, nope. I can't remember. Bit. I can't remember if you were in yeah. me or you. It's just one of those things where, like, with Roald Dahl, if he takes that, like, childlike edge out of his, or, like, softness uh. out of his books, I'm all, is the edge too hard? Like, is it mm. is it too tricky to read an adult fiction from him? I don't know. Mm. Maybe someday we'll get the guts to read it. <laughs> I I bought it. The yeah. because I was actually curious about some of the things at the end. So if you haven't seen Sandman on Netflix, um, oh, I was going Roald Dahl, but yes, yeah, I'm okay. sorry, I was thinking that, and then I bought that comic, and it, anyways, they did a good job adapting. I'll just say that. Um, which book were you saying about Roald? Dahl? Oh, Roald Dahl, his adult fiction. Oh, uh, it's just saying yeah, yeah, yeah. that that would be it'd be tricky to move into adult with yes. him because I've noticed that when I go from I've had similar experiences with Neil. Well, even. You know, I will say like even, you know, reading Harry Potter and then, you know, Rowling came out with adult after that and published it under a different pen name. Yes. And I chose not to read it. Yeah. I think it's hard to kind of shift when you have something so ingrained. Like I need to leave more room there probably. It's more like if you could read it and not know who the author is, yeah. then it's like you can enjoy the experience for what it is with the book. Yeah, which I get why she got a pen name because I think a lot of people struggle to like shift mental gears. Yeah. We're all fascinating. It is so interesting. Yeah, especially because like I have read really difficult adult fiction before, but when yes. you like come into it with the context of the author, that's a tricky line to walk. Yeah, and I mean, it's clearly on me as the reader it's that I'm struggling to be like, I don't want to identify this author with anything over here because mm. I've associated them with this series in my childhood and I'd like to keep that pure and I don't want it to mess with where how I feel about it. Yes. And so that's my choice, but it's got to be hard as an author when you have something like that happen, like JK did, mm -hmm. uh, where it gets so massive and becomes people's identities, oh, you yes. know, like and even the actors from the movies. Like, they struggled to get some parts because everyone's like, and that's Harry Potter. Yeah. You know, and so Daniel took the radical <laughs> Daniel's shift. like, we're going to go one, hard hundred, left. 180. <laughs> I'm going to be naked in Broadway on stage making out with the horses. And we're like, you do you, man. <laughs> and he's like, country. see, I'm not just playing a child anymore. You know, like, he really wanted to break out of that. Just, like, remove the context of yeah. Harry Potter. 
I mean, yeah. you can try, Daniel, but it's never going to happen. But I mean, you'll always be a little bit of Harry Potter. <laughs> no, Hermione, it was interesting because I watched The End of the World. It's like one oh, of those yeah. like dude humor movies. And Tyler was like, this will be a good idea. Oh, yeah, I did too. We got like two thirds of the way and I was like, it's the same joke over and over. It I was like, okay, I got it, guys. This is really just like Seth Rogen and all of his friends wanted to get high on camera. <laughs> and they're like, make it a film. Anyways, there's one part where Emma. Uh, Emma comes in and she just like has like a shotgun or something and like steals all their food or something. And they're like, it cuts to them. And they're like, and then Hermione came and she took all of our food <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. I know, it was like this beautiful, like a perfect moment when it she comes in. It was just so funny because they call her Hermione. Yeah. Like they didn't know her real name, but they're <laughs> all playing themselves. Yeah. They're, they're all playing themselves living in Hollywood. So they're not characters. Yeah. It's just like if an apocalypse happened, what would happen to all these Hollywood characters or people yeah. who live in Hollywood? And I remember she, that. It was fun. That was the that was the pinnacle of the movie. Yes. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Emma. <laughs> I even said that to my husband at the time. I turned over after we finished and I go, Emma was the best part of that show. hundred percent. Hermione, whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> she was the best part. Um, We're just all over the place. We are. I love but it. I do want to go back to whimsy. I want to talk about Peter Pan. Oh, okay. Because that's the next on our list. And I feel like it's similar genre, this like children's fantasy mm -hmm. and adapting it. First of all, Peter Pan is a problematic book for now. Now, yeah. There's just like straight up racism in the book. Yeah. And, um, and I think it's like important to recognize that. I do think the characteristics or I think there's elements of the story that were pulled from the story that absolutely withstand the test of time. Yes, I agree. And so if we're going to pull out, tease out the reasons why, like why people keep making films about this. I mean, there was a lot of films about this. I just yes. picked my the ones that I had seen or that are the most popular. But oh, yeah, there are quite a few. Yes. Well, first of all, I feel like the island of Neverland. Mm -hmm is iconic like this magical island you escape to with mermaids and pirates yeah. and fairies and lost boys like oh. an orphanage i think those things are magic and the idea of that that these kids are from london which mm -hmm. has the big ben london and them flying with fairy dust yeah. i'm like these are the elements that i think draw us back to peter pan again and again and again yeah but I'm like, it is for sure a book laced with racism. And so I think it's important to recognize that, too. Um, because, I mean, the author obviously was informed by the culture of the time. I'm trying to remember when this book was written originally. Um, but oh, it, it's got to be in like, I don't know, 30s or 40s. Yes. 1930s, 40s, somewhere in there. Um, it's, just, it's interesting because, you know, as you're talking about like the thing, the problematic themes in the movie, or sorry, excuse me, the book. Do you ever think about that now? I think about this all the time where I'm like, what am I doing literally now that is perfectly acceptable socially um, that won't be in the next 50 years? <laughs> Does that ever get to you? Sometimes I'm yes. like, what am I going to be like? Oh, I wish I had known better. You know, 50 years. Yes. Okay, pretend so I'm still alive in 50 years. But This was written in 1904. So 120. 1904. Okay. Yeah. So 120 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I'm like, for example, um, if you would have asked me five years ago, just thinking back, to being self-reflective, yeah. right? And, and really questioning like my paradigms. And I'm like, five years ago, if you would have told me that I need to be conscious of pronouns, I, you, we just wouldn't exactly. have understood what that meant. We would have been like, pronouns to what? Like, it would have been like, in a sentence, a pronoun, mm -hmm. you know? And thinking about pronouns as how a person represents themselves how they identify with themselves and um so the idea of like heterosexuality like in a hundred years who knows or maybe it'll pivot so hard that it'll be like much more narrow-minded it is because we've done that throughout history i know i was just i watched the netflix um Docu series. It's like a documentary drama, a drama docu dramedy. I don't know. I love those. It, it's of uh, Alexander the Great. Oh. So they did one with Cleopatra and then Alexander the Great. And it's kind of like the acting is like stage acting where it's not bad, but it's not motion picture. But it feels a little more performative. Almost. Yes, but like, it feels more performative and it has like full s props and sets and like mm. it's a full production, but it doesn't feel like cinematics or it doesn't feel like big screen yeah yeah it feels more like theater yeah. and 
the critics just don't know what the hell to do with it. They're like, <laughs> I don't know, six out of 10. It's not what we know. And I'm just like, eh, get over it, people. It's cool because you learn about history, but it's like sexy and Ooh. fun. Oh my gosh. Have you not seen the Alexander the Great? We're watching this Netflix series, right? And at any minute, like all six of the main warriors, like Alexander and um, like all of the characters look like someone just took the cast from Magic Mike. Oh, gosh. And they were like, <laughs> put them in, like, m- like war garb. Like, put them in a kilt. Send them out into Macedonia. Like, it. it so it, Alexander the Great pretty much caused the collapse of the Persian Empire, mm. right? And um, he thought he was the son of Zeus. Like, he thought he was a demigod. And his mom kind of encouraged that, right? And uh, so... This is just like an epic series on Netflix. And it's also like as you're watching it, just be like, why is there so much sexual tension between like all of the men? Oh, really? That's so interesting. It is fascinating. But how do we get here? We got here because I was talking about like sexual uh, orientation. Okay. And I was like, they talk a lot in that series about how like Macedonia, which is Greece, um, how we know we know it as Greece today, Mm -hmm. how it is like sex was just sex and like there wasn't really like was orientation fluid. yeah it was very fluid and you were like attracted to people but not necessarily gender like this was a cultural thing mm. which is so interesting and then you go to like you know you think about how the collapse of the persian empire and then alexander dies spoiler <laughs> alexander the great dies but you know all these then history goes into kind of like um there's like the rise and fall of the Roman Empire and all these things where then it becomes like these Catholic or these Christian crusades. Mm-hmm. And then you enter into kind of uh, the medieval period and we get like this real tightening of values and of worldviews and it becomes very limited in yeah. what you're safe to believe. and Very rigid on that. Yes. And what you're, how you're safe you, there's a lack of safety in acting independently. Yeah. Right. And like your, like your life is on the line. Yeah. If you are attracted to the same gender or if you believe in multiple gods or all these things. And so I'm like, we can look back, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. and we can see where in history uh, there were certain things that were okay at one point and weren't okay. And we think that we're always progressing forward. Yeah. But there is this interesting thing where history does repeat itself. And so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like you have to check yourself in the context of where you're at right now and then think like, is, am I on the right side of history right now? <laughs> you know what I mean? Doing my best, Alex. Just, I know. Yeah, we're all doing our best. <laughs> I know. But I'm sorry. Was that too long? No, it's fine. I, it was, it was something I put out there because it's something I think about because it, how there's no way to prepare for it, right? Like, right. Looking back, hindsight, that's the only thing that you can get out of it. It's just like, I know more now than I did then. And that is how this comes up so much in literature, is why I, I wanted to bring it up. And yeah. Thank you for expanding on it. It's um, somehow, <laughs> no, yeah, it was interesting to learn. And that so many books or authors get canceled because they don't, they're not sensitive to the society we have now in a lot of ways or like, yeah. that's, you know, an racist or, you know, sexist, whatever it is. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times they'll make adjustments and try to update them. Like there's several, like even Agatha Christie books that I've read that they're completely different in a lot of ways. Like the titles are different even. Um, yes. Or, you know, they've had to edit those out. Same thing back in the forties, fifties, perfectly fine to say what she was saying, but not okay now. You know, it's so uncomfortable to read now. And it's just something I always think about. I'm like, huh, I wonder what the, those things will be when I'm like on my on my way out of yes. this life, when I look back and just from this moment, be like, how many things have changed that have, you know, yeah. as our society's grown and and fluctuated. But that was a fun little thought experiment. Well, yeah, it's an important <laughs> conversation. I mean, because we brought it up at, with Peter Pan where it's like, I think it's just important to remember as a reader and as a human um, that like you also will be dated. Yeah. At some point in time. Yes. And so approach life with, I feel like you need to approach life with thoughtfulness, mm-hmm. but also with self-compassion. Like a little bit of grace for 
yourself and others. And yeah, it's not like I love reading things that make me uncomfortable that are maybe racist or something now. It's just that I get that it wasn't a problem then, you know? And so it's like- Or that it wasn't a recognized problem. At the time, it was seen as fine, you know, whatever. It wasn't recognized, like you said. And so it's like I I hold that in one hand and then in the other hand, I'm like, but it makes me a little uncomfortable. But we could do better now. And so I, I, yeah. Anyways, we can talk about that for a long time. Yeah, it's just, it's important, I think, to hold, uh, you can hold two truths, that um, this person did it in potentially ignorance or uh, insensitivity, and that we can do better now, and then understand that sometimes that will shift in the sense that you will, people will look back at you and recognize that there were things that you weren't sensitive about and that you want grace to be included in that conversation yeah. because I definitely know that like looking back even five years ago as we mentioned yeah like yeah, we was- we are better now than we were five years ago and we want to continue to get better but have compassion on the you of the past yeah and then move forward and that's kind of how you can grow so it's very interesting the world literature a little therapy moment yeah there you go and I'm like let's talk about the Disney film in 1953 so this came out 50 years oh, after the yeah. book and I'm like staple of my childhood totally and i was just like of course we (laughs) talk about native americans in this way or indigenous peoples this way of course it's not a problem even 25 years ago i'm watching the disney film and we're just like neat yeah (laughs) yes uh even at elementary junior high for me yeah was not a problem like i'm just thinking about it just was not costumes even for Halloween. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it just wasn't a thing. And I get now fully as an adult, like, oh, that was inappropriate, you know, like yeah. having the context and just so interesting. All the things that have changed just in the last 20 years. I know. Us. Um, totally remember the Disney film, like the little clock sound. It's like you, I yes. immediately hear that in my head, you know, the the crocodile and the little yes. tail. Do, do, do. 100%. You know, like it's just there and you can just see a stubborn little sassy tink and her little yes. pouting, you know, foot stomps, things like that, <laughs> like that are just ingrained and just hearing the boys be like, Nana, like, you know, I they know. talk to their dog. And so, yes, raised on it as well. It's a beautiful little cartoon film. And I don't really have, I mean, the criticism now is obviously there. I get why. Yes. But it's just, it's an interesting, well, I just think that um, now we have the, have a deeper compassion yeah for uh for history and circumstances and for what happened to the indigenous people right and so then our behaviors we we are in our behaviors can be informed with more knowledge um so i did think it was very whimsical when we were children to have that experience but we were experiencing it as white children and so i think that that's why it was like oh this is fun Mm -hmm. so it's important then we pivot and we go to hook in 1991 okay, and this yeah. is just very different like it is yes. not about it is about the original book but it definitely does not have as many racist undertones mm-hmm. or overtones <laughs> uh, at all like yeah. it, i mean there might be a few in there and i'm open to that that feedback but it was just it was directed by steven spielberg yes. and it is all about hook and it was i felt like i loved this awesome. movie i loved it i loved it it was one of the first and I may be wrong, but for me, it was one of the first Disney adaptions that was live. Yes. Anima- no, it wasn't animated, right? And so yes. it was um, played out as more of a he, like a conclusion after Peter Pan. Not conclusion, but sort of like, here's the epilogue. Peter's grown up, you know, with Hook. He's forgotten who he was when yep. he was a boy and uh, and being a lost boy and all of that. And uh, it was such a unique take on the story that, oh my gosh, Robin Williams really was like the perfect person because yes. he has such childlike qualities about him. And uh, it had Dustin Hoffman in, it, Hoffman in it and he was Captain Hook. Which he was so good. So good. Like you've seen Dustin Hoffman in a lot of things, I'm sure. Didn't yeah. he do Tootsie too? Like, like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, I think he did. I'm like, let's look that up. He just... He has been so many different characters. Yes. And I'm like, Dustin Hoffman as Captain Hook was so scary. Yes. I remember being super creeped out mm-hmm. by him, especially when he kind of took like, um, was it 
it, it was Robin Williams' son that he yep. kind of like took yeah. under his wing. And so you're like, I felt as a little kid, I was like, he's not safe. Yeah. It's not safe space. Yeah. I just remember him putting the, you know, his hook on the wall when he goes to steal his children. And this is like, yeah, like all down the side of the wall and like all creepy like. And I'm mm-hmm. all just like a horror film. Uh, but that's how Hook would have been in real life, you yes. know? And then when you get to interact with him more throughout the movie when he's there in Neverland, like, it's a little bit more like the goofy side of him, which helps because I was like, dude, this is freaking me out. Um, <laughs> but it just gave that sense of fear that Robin needed, right? To like push him out to Neverland. But and then we have Julia Roberts as Tinker. I know she was really cute. So cute. I loved her in that. And Maggie Smith, who's queen. I know. freaking love Maggie. I remember the one of the most vivid parts that showed to me is when she Tink is in the dollhouse. And then someone says they don't believe in fairies. And she just, like, drops dead. (laughs) And then she, like, falls down the stairs. It's, like, the most dramatic way for a little tink to die. And I'm like, spoiler, she lives. (laughs) But I remember being like, oh, my gosh. what? You know what's crazy? I was just thinking about this. So Maggie Smith plays Granny Wendy, right? Like, she's an old lady retired. In the 90s? In 1991. And I'm all, girlfriend has been playing these granny characters. Like, these really... Like strong, independent, willful, uh, sassy, older women. older women for a long time. Yeah. She like entered 50 and she was like, <laughs> it's my golden era for but, the next 50 years. Oh, man. She's incredible. I oh, love yeah. Maggie Smith. Um, yes. Okay. So I love this adaption. It was, I thought it was great, heartwarming, mm-hmm. Look, some good lessons in there. You know, you don't want to only want to be a kid, but you also can't only ever want, only want to be an adult too. Yeah. It's kind of like... You need both. You know, you have to have your inner child in you and you have to enjoy childhood as much as you can and remember those qualities. Um, but just to be present was kind of what I got out of that one. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. Like, I also kind of got it was um, there was a lot of movies in the 80s and 90s where the dad was just like a workaholic. Yeah, that's like true. like or he just was all about rising the corporate ladder and wasn't there for his kids. Like, that was the whole premise of, like, the Santa Claus, right, with Tim Allen. Yeah. So I'm just like, that was such a trope in the 80s and 90s of, like, dads being absentee or just being, like, not happy to be a dad. Mm. And that's kind of like Robin Williams was not connected to his children in the beginning. Like, yeah, they just felt like he was kind of disassociated from their life. Yeah, and I so mean, he was, like, yeah. Yeah, and then he went back to Neverland and found his yeah. childlike wonder, which was fun. I'm like, then we get to 2003 and they made Peter Pan and it had, it was the one with Jeremy Sumter in it. And I remember everyone just I thought he one. was, it's okay. You're fine. <laughs> everyone thought <laughs> he was like see that so hot, right? Like all the people who were his age. He was like oh. one of those, like Jonathan Taylor Thomas, right? Like, like they thought it was like, JTT. Yeah, I know. Huh? <laughs> oh man, that's my era. Okay. Yes. So they all thought he was so cute. And um, actually, Jason uh, Isaacs, is that who you say his name? He's um, oh, Lucius Malfoy. Lucius. Lucius Malfoy. He played Hook in it. Oh. And it got okay reviews. That's why I'm like, I don't know if I've heard of this one. But it was like a lot of children grew up on this. I just think you and I were just a little bit too old for it to resonate. Oh, okay. And so it it kind of came and went. So that was 2003. Yes. And then 2004, they had Finding Neverland. Which is the Johnny Depp one with okay, Kate I Winslet. I did like this one. Me too. This one was really sweet. I thought that this one was really beautifully done. It also had Dustin Hoffman in it again. Oh, did it? Yes. Oh my gosh, you're right. It had like this magical realism, right? For sure. That's kind of the vibe. For sure. I will never forget. So I was um, brand new newlywed. Yes. Literally, that's the year we got married. And we watched this in our new little apartment. I remember being like, movie night, you know, like cute first (laughs) month of marriage. I don't know. And we watched that movie. And very much speaks to me. I'm all about like stories, magical realism, magic, all of that, and just thinking out of the box. And so I was like, oh, I loved it. And I was just like so inspired. I look over at my husband and he was like, he just stared at me. And I'm like, what? And he's like, is that how you think? Like it like blew his mind because he had never watched a movie like that before. Oh. (laughs) And I was just like, what? And he was just like, is that like how your brain works? He's like, that was the best version like the best thing for me to watch so I could get a better understanding of like how you think. I don't know why it was like more memory where I was like, welcome, buddy. Like, where have you been? You're like, life doesn't have to be boring. Yeah. Well, he's just, you know, very logical. I get it. And just to have him, Mm -hmm. it felt like a romp through a creative mind. Right. 
And yes. so he just, I remember him really appreciating it because he's like, that was so beautiful. I could get a better understanding of you and feeling how connected you were to it. Yeah, which is interesting. Magical realism is actually just like a really controversial yes. like genre. And I think that's so weird because there are so <laughs> many people who are like, be fantasy or be real. Mm. And I'm all, no. <laughs> No, <laughs> I know I, you and I both really have an appreciation and love for magical realism, mm -hmm. but it is actually a very polarizing genre yeah. because people, uh, when you identify so strongly with fiction, yeah. then you start to feel, I think, a little uh, ungrounded mm -hmm. in magical realism. Like if if you need to ground yourself in the story, like, okay, yes. this is fantasy, so I know what the rules are, and then I feel safe. But in magical realism, they're like, there's really no rules. Like, sometimes it seems like magic, but was it magic? You don't really know. <laughs> People are like, I don't feel safe. And I'm all, that feels like a you thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just about going on the journey. It, yeah. What if, okay, there has only been like maybe one book where I was like, I literally don't know fully what I read, but it was beautiful. But what the hell did I just read? Oh, yeah, I know what you're going to say. Starless Sea? Yes. The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern was, it felt like this poem that never ended. Yes. It felt like a 350-page poem. Yeah. And so by the end, I was all, huh. Yeah. It was like, I kind of got it. It was kind of yeah. like a, it was like her take on a, a choose your own adventure novel. Okay. That's a great way to put it. Like, um, like a, she had talked about how you can have in video games, there's like open worlds mm -hmm. where you get to just choose where you get to go and explore. Yeah. And that's what the novel kind of felt like is like you were just with a person who kept choosing the visuals. Yeah. And the, um, the prose yeah. were so beautiful were, in that book. Exactly. I'm like, there's so many you could pull out and they were gorgeous frame because they're yes. just beautifully worded. But literally with like the whole story, I was like, like that was a lot of magical realism to the point where I'm like, I don't know if that was a story or a poem. It kind of feels <laughs> like a dream. Yeah. Feels yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of like if a dream in surrealism art had a baby, it'd be that book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was interesting. So. Um, okay. Then there was the 2015 pan with Hugh Jackman, which I really Ooh. did. I don't think I watched this one either. I watched it once. What? And I know. And it also, like, the 2023 one didn't get amazing reviews. Wait, there was one last year? And then there was one last year. And and I'm like, I didn't see the one last year, but I'm just like, in 2023. Peter Pan and Wendy? Yes. And I'm just like, here's the thing. I just, I feel like people can't walk away from this <laughs> book. Know. I'm like, they're still making them. Yeah. And I think, honestly, it's just the nostalgia of Neverland. Mm -hmm. Like, people can't get away from Neverland. They love it so much. I mean, clearly. I know. They just keep making it. But my favorite was Hook, of all the ones Me I've too. seen. I just was like, Spielberg, once Spielberg touches a book, you just like, I like, yes, it is done. <laughs> I mean, I really enjoyed Finding Neverland, but it's not one I want to return to again and again. Whereas, like, Hook, I'm like, come on, kids, family and I. Yes. You know, and I watched that one multiple times. For sure. And Finding Neverland, my kids just aren't entertained by it. And so I'm like, it felt like more for adults. Well, folks, I think we're going to just have to make a part five <laughs> Fucking a. of this series because we just can't stop talking about them and we have more to talk about. Plus, so. I had that whole like, let me talk about the Macedonian Empire because that's important. People should know about history. Uh, dude, I, I appreciate also, it. Also, though, anybody who goes and watches that Netflix, the <laughs> I'm like, it's weird. Well, first of all, he did have a lover who was a man that yeah. like stuck with him throughout his entire illustrious career as a demigod. Okay. Alexander. But I'm just like, it's weird that they're all so hot because they look like they just were like in London and they were like, Magic Mike London crew, we're going to need you in this production. And then they all came and the acting's not bad. I'm just like, whoever their pro the producer was was like, we know sex sells. Get him in the docuseries. <laughs> 100%. Bring him I, in. It was fascinating. I was just like, what's happening? Who made these calls? I want to see behind the scenes. <laughs> well, I mean, now I'm intrigued. So it was a delight to learn about history <laughs> while watching sexy people battle. <laughs> I was like, there you go. And this episode is brought to you by Netflix. <laughs> it's not. They don't pay us anything. We're unhinged. This is great. <laughs>
We're going with it. I know. Okay. Well, we're, we have, we got through two. <laughs> I swear. I'm excited though. Cause it, okay. We're going to wrap up on part five because we have EZA yes. coming up and Scarlet Letter, which I would yes. love to talk about. We've got like Vampire Academy. So there's some good ones that we're going to end on. I promise we will yes. end. Ella Enchanted. Yeah. There's Aragon, A Wrinkle in Time, The Golden Compass, Sharp Objects, Gone Girl, Station oh, no. Eleven. Now we're at part eight. Percy Jackson, <laughs> Silo. Did you watch Silo? I you sure guys, did. I, our crew is like freaking out. Yeah. We can't stop talking. Production. <laughs> I know. Silo is so good. Anyways, there's books and movies are great. So maybe what we'll do is these things will happen, but we might just take like a five Spread episode break and yeah. then come back to it because... uh. We love stories. Yeah. So anyway, totally. thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please make sure to rate and review us so that we can keep doing these episodes. And like a good book, recommend us to your friends. <laughs>